Okay, we're going to begin some warm up. This will be at 200 words per minute. We have Mr. Gordonier for the plaintiff, Mr. Stout for defense. Let's identify. I'm Mr. Gordonier for the plaintiff. I'm the witness. I'm the court. I'm defense attorney, Mr. Stout. That's Mr. Gordonier. Okay. Mr. Gordonier, for the record. Well, I think the entire line of questioning is beyond the scope of direct. No, it isn't. And furthermore, don't argue back and forth and don't say anything when there is an objection until he's finished. I'm sorry. I thought he was. Okay, the objection is overruled. Very well, Your Honor. Thank you. How old are you, Mr. Stout? Are you living in rented quarters? Mr. Stout, how old are you? Too old. 67 with due consideration. You'd be a good advertisement for those who are opposed to mandatory retirement. All right, let's go. If you'll excuse me, I hold that to be a fine compliment, sir. Well, I consider it such. You live in rented quarters? Yes. Do you know what the rent is? Yes, 400 You and the children live in that apartment or whatever it is? Yes. Who pays the freight? Pays the freight? Who pays the rent? My mother. Is your mother working? Yes, she's a certified nursing assistant. Are you employed? No, I'm a housewife. Is your father employed? No. Other than those I have named, does anybody else live within the family circle where you are? Yes. Is that other person your sister? Yes. Does she work? No. And how old are you now? 23. Is your sister married? No. Does she have children? Yes, she has two. Ages, sex, names? <clears throat> Excuse me, Your Honor. Again, I fail to see the direction that counsel is taking as being foundational to any of the issues that were raised in the direct examination of the witness Council has had an opportunity to explore the witness's current background and circumstances, and I believe we're getting into an area of irrelevance, and I believe we're far afield from direct, and I would object on those bases. All right, the objection is overruled. Don't take us too far on these family matters, Mr. Stout. Two children she has? Yes. How old, respectively? Six and six months, a boy and a girl. Does she live with you with her children? Yes. Do you and she and your respective children live separately from your mother and father? No. Your mother, father, you, your sister, and all the children all live in one establishment, is that correct? Yes. Is there a car? Yes, we have two. Your Honor, I think that we've reached that point where we've gone far beyond the necessary scope, and I'd object. All right, let's go on. Thank you. On the total number of occasions when you lived with Philip and his wife, whether it was in one place or another, what was the total amount of time you lived with them? The total amount of time? I'm going to ask the council lay a further foundation, and I'm going to object to the question as being vague. It might be better if we approach the sidebar for me to explain to you the basis for the objection, rather than explaining it in front of the jury. All right. What is the total amount of time that you lived with Mr. Nero and his wife? Approximately five years. During that entire five years, you were married? Yes. How long ago was the last time that you lived with Mr. Nero and his wife, your sister? How long ago was the last time? When I went to the Virgin Islands in 1980. Did you work in the VI? Sometimes. Did Carl work? Yes. For whom? For Philip. For whom did Philip work? For himself. You know that there's a brother and his wife in the Virgin Islands? Yes. You know that they operate two stores, do you not? Now, yes, but not then. It was Philip who had those stores. How do you know that? He is the one who told everybody how to run the stores. How to run them and owning them are two different things. Which is which? Excuse me, Your Honor. The question is argumentative. The witness has testified as to the basis of her knowledge. Counsel's question and the form of the question are totally improper, and I'm objecting on that basis. All right, would you clarify your last question? Do you know whether he was telling you a truth or a falsehood when he... Your Honor, again, that calls for speculation on the part of the witness, and I'm going to object to the form of the question, and I'm objecting on that basis, and I'll submit it to the court. All right, the objection is overruled. He's just asking you whether you know whether what he said was true or false. No. In what store or stores did you work in the Virgin Islands? American fashion. For how many days? Off and on for eight months. How often was off and on? Every other day. Who worked the alternate day? Carl. Were you paid for your services? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. Is it a fair characterization that when you worked at the two stores in California that you did not receive any compensation? Right. With what frequency did you work? 
And what time, Your Honor? I'm going to object. I haven't finished the question. My apologies. With all due respect. Okay, finish it. How many times a week did you work in either place, if you recall? I don't remember. Whenever it was needed. Who determined what the need was? Philip? Yes. He asked you to help out at the store? No. He commanded you to work at the store? Yes. At that time you had children? Yes. You were living with Carl and your children and with Philip and his wife? Yes. Do you know whether you and Carl ever paid any money for your living costs? No, I don't. It's a fact, is it not, that you did not, to your knowledge, make any contribution for your support and your family's support? I do not know. Excuse me, I'm going to object to the use of the words make any contribution. That's an ambiguous phrase. Clearly what the witness has testified to could be considered as a type of contribution. Are you talking about money? Yes, sir. Very well, with that understanding, I'll withdraw the objection. All right. Do you know? No, I don't know. Did your husband ever tell you that he paid any money to the Nero's on account of the support of you and your family? Calls for hearsay, object on that basis. The objection is overruled. No. So as far as you know then, no money was ever paid to them for your keep? Correct. In the islands, is that also true? Carl worked in the stores there. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you about money, nothing else. Do you know whether Carl was ever paid? I don't know. I want to go back and see if I can get a ballpark figure from you with reference to the number of times you worked in California. It's been asked and answered, Your Honor. She said she didn't know. Don't talk back and forth. He objected. The objection is overruled. Okay, this will be warm up at uh, 210 words per minute. <clears throat> we have um, Mr. Tanazaki for the plaintiff and Ms. Barnum for defense. Let's identify. I am Mr. Tanazaki for the plaintiff. I'm the witness. I'm the court. I'm defense attorney, Ms. Debbie Barnum. Okay, 14s please, are you ready? Okay, and it's a court for the record. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Tanazaki, you may call your first witness. Before we do, Your Honor, I wanted to inform the court as investigating officer in this case is Detective Richard Ralston from the City of Anaheim Police Department. All right. He is in the back. He is being identified to the jurors. He may sit at council table with the prosecutor being designated as investigating officer. Our first witness is Jamie Nickel. All right. Stand at the end of the table, face the clerk, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please state your name. Jamie Nickel. Will you spell that, please? J-A-M-I-E-N-I-C-K-E-L-L. You may have a seat in the witness stand. Good morning. I'm going to ask that you stand and pull the microphone down and speak right into it. You speak mm -hmm. quite faintly, so we want to be able to hear you, okay? Miss Nickel, how old are you right now? 18. On January 29, 1995. Were you 17 at that time? Yes. Back on January 29, 1995, were you staying at the SNS Motel at 2255 West Lincoln in the city of Anaheim, County of Orange? Yes. And who were you living with at that particular motel? Friends, Goldie and his ex girlfriend, Sweets. And Goldie's true name was William St. Julian? Objection, Your Honor. Foundation. Overruled. So on January 29, 1995, what was your relationship with Goldie? My boyfriend. We were living together. And how long had you been living together? About three weeks, but then at that motel was about a week we were living there. So you were living together for a week and you had a relationship for about three weeks? Uh-huh. Is that a yes? Yes. And during that time, did, Ms. did Mr. St. Julian or Goldie supply you with drugs? Yes. And was that, how did you use those drugs? Did you use them or did you sell them or what did you do with it? I used them. And what kind of drugs did he give you? Cocaine. Now, was that part of the reason that you were living with Goldie? No. And on January 29th, 1995, at 1130 at night, were the two of you in room 224 of the SNS Motel? Yes. Take a look at the diagram that's marked People's 1 for identification that's on the board, though not to scale, as indicated on the diagram. Does that kind of give a floor plan of the apartment, the room that you were staying in? Yes. And does it again, even though not to scale, does it fairly and accurately depict the various furnishings that were inside the room? Yes. 
Now at 11.30 p.m. on January 29th, 1995, did you hear something at the front door? A knock on the door. Okay, and was where were you when you heard a knock on the front door? Laying on the couch. And which couch would you be referring to? The one in the living room by the table. Your Honor, can I approach the witness? Yes. Why don't you go ahead with this green marker and just put a X where you were at 11.30? Okay. Okay, so you marked a very small X. You can go ahead and take a seat. You marked a very small X by what looks to be a rectangular couch in the living portion of that particular room. Is that right? Yes. And where was Goldie at the time when you heard this knock? By the front door. Okay, and is the front door, where is the front door on this particular diagram? Is it indicated by this opening to this room in this particular diagram? This opening right here, is that correct? Uh-huh. Is that a yes? Yes. You have to say yes or no. Sorry. And when the knock was heard, what, if anything, did Goldie do? He opened the door and he said, hold on, that he'd be out in a minute. He closed the door. Repeat it kind of slowly. He opened the door and he cracked the door and he said he'd be out in a minute. And what happened next after he made that statement? I was talking to him, and a few seconds after that, that's when G came into the room. So after he said, hold on for a minute, there was a some kind of conversation between you and Goldie, is that right? Yes, we were talking. And how long was that conversation? About a minute, maybe less. Well, how long do you have any idea? Was it short, fast? Short. And then you said that G came in after. Yes. Did Where was Goldie when G, and by the way, who is G? Him. Who are you pointing to? The man in the white shirt over there at the end of the table. Identifying Mr. Williams? Yes. And you know him to be called G? Yes. And did which area did he enter into the room from? Excuse me? Did he enter through the front door? Yes. And where was Goldie when G entered the room through the front door? Standing right next to the door by the chair, I guess. You're talking about the front door? Yes. Is that a yes or is that no? Yes, he was standing right there. When G entered the room, did he have anything in his hands? A gun. And what did you see happen next as he entered the room with the gun? Goldie turned and looked at him and they exchanged a couple words to each other. And the next thing I saw Goldie, he raised his hand. G raised his hand and Goldie reached for his arm and there was just a struggle and started moving around and gunshots were fired. So the first thing that you saw after G entered the room was a gun in G's hand? Yes. In which hand? The right hand. What kind of gun was it? Can you describe it? It was black is all I know. And when he first entered the room, how was he holding the gun? He was holding it down by one side on the side. So did he have the gun, if I can be used as a demonstration, did he have his right arm and the gun pointed down on the ground, basically? Yes, when he first walked in. And as he entered the room, how quickly did he, that is, G, raise his hand with the gun? Immediately. And then what, in what direction did Mr. Williams or G point the gun? Towards Goldie. This will be more warm up at um, 210 words per minute. We have Mr. Matthews for the people and Mr. Talman for defense. Let's identify. Mr. Matthews for the people. I am the witness. I am the court. Mr. Talman for defense. And it's a court for the record. 14. 14. 14. 14. This is a matter of the people of the state of California versus Peter Allen Hedrick. We are in a continued limine motions. Today we are going to handle a Miranda issue at the, there were two. You are talking about the Miranda at the initial stop and also said something about a statement at the police department. My understanding is the prosecution is now going to be moving in the statement at the police department. We are limiting this issue as to statements made at the time of the stop. The statement that Mr. Talman indicated he had some problem with at the police department, since there are a couple of statements, is a particular statement that I am not going to attempt to use because Officer Lazar is not sure, you know, at what point the statement was made, whether it was before or after Miranda was given. While he believes it was after Miranda, he is not sure, and I'm not going to attempt to make use of it. At one point, Mr. Mason and Mr. Hedrick are being watched by Officer Lazar, and his police report indicates that at some point, Officer Lazar said something to the effect of, why did you cut his throat? Let me just get it from the police report. If it is not even coming in. But he wants to identify the statement to avoid. To see which one, I know what Lenny is worried about. At any point, it is a very brief conversation. When Officer Lazar is guarding Mr. Mason and Mr. Hedrick, Mr. Hedrick responds to a question by Officer Lazar. Mason does? Mason does, and then there is a conversation between Mr. Mason and Mr. Hedrick about the 
disposition of a particular item. It is a cell phone, I believe, and that statement is what I thought was of concern. Perhaps it is not. Oh, yeah, he does have a conversation about the cell phone. So you're not going to get into that statement at all? No, I'm not going to get into that particular statement. With that understanding, then, can we combine the Miranda issue at the detention along with any additional testimony you wish to give on the 1538.5 by just calling Officer Lazar for both purposes? That's fine. We are prepared to submit the 1538.5. We can review and argue it on Monday. Very good. You mean Tuesday. Tuesday, excuse me. I would call Officer Lazar, Your Honor. Has he been sworn? Could you raise your right hand, officer? I do. Please be seated. State your name and spell your last name for the record. Jean Lazar, L-A-Z-A-R. Officer Lazar, you've testified several times in this particular matter now, so you can refresh your recollection a little bit. You were involved in the stop of a vehicle on August the 28th. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 